This program is made possible by generous supporters like you. what I want to say to you today. When it comes to trusting in the Lord, you say, why should I trust in the Lord? Number one, you got to know him to trust him. You, you got to, you got to begin to know him to trust him. That's why the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. Why does faith come by hearing the word of the Lord? Because when you hear the word of God, when you read the word, when you listen to the word, when you meditate upon the word, you begin to realize the nature and the character of God, that he is trustworthy in every time, every time he's never failing. He's never late. He's always on time and he's always trustworthy. You can trust in him. From all time, the Lord has been writing this story of saying, I am trustworthy. Why do you keep trusting in this and that? Why do you keep putting your hope in this and that? Those things will fail you, but put your trust in me, for I will not fail you. And I know immediately there's some pushback. And some of you in your, in your mind, you may not even want to be thinking this, but there's something in you that's saying, but Pastor Mark, what about that time that I put my trust in God and it didn't work out the way I thought it was going to. What, what about that time that, that man, I, I really was trusting the Lord and it doesn't seem like he's very trustworthy because I thought things were going to work out differently. And can I tell you today, I understand that question. I understand that I don't have the answers for all of those situations and circumstances. They are a struggle to press through. But can I tell you today that assuredly on the word of God, that the Lord is trustworthy Time and time and time again because he's working behind the scenes in, in areas that we've never even seen or know of. Right now, some of you are facing a situation and you're just struggling with, Lord, where are you and what are you, what are you doing? And behind the scenes, you don't know it, but God is preparing steps and, and making plans and ordering, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> ordering things out that you don't even know or, that he's doing. It's a behind the scenes, underground work. The thing that is happening, it's a, a work that matures you and grows you behind the scenes. It's, it's like the question that Mary and Martha had when Lazarus died. They didn't expect Lazarus to die because Jesus was the answer. And they put their trust in him. So they sent word while he was sick. He was still sick. Lord, come. Come. If you'll just come, we put our trust in you. But Jesus, the Bible says Jesus waited. He, he, he waited intentionally. And, and, and so they, they had this struggle of faith. And and this is where a lot of us are. Like, Lord, I don't understand that this is not how it's supposed to work out. Lazarus died. And when Jesus shows up, he's so late that now he's stinking. It's not even just like right now, immediately. It's like he'd been dead a while and he's stinking. So it's too late now. Just, no, you're too late. And the deal is Jesus wasn't too late. Jesus knew exactly what he was doing and all of their questions and all of their struggle and all of that. It was, it was his plan and his purpose. So I'm just saying to you, sometimes in the midst of God's plan, it can feel like it's not a very good plan. And those questions are okay, but we can still put our trust and our hope in him because he's faithful Amen. and he's trustworthy. There's a couple of examples that I want to read through this morning and allow them to be a source of strength for us. The first one is found in 2 Chronicles chapters number 31 and 32. If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn there. 2 Chronicles chapters 31 and 32. We're going to pick up at the end of chapter 31. And um, I'm going to jump around because some of the details I'm going to leave out for time's sake. But I want you to see this story of Hezekiah and Sennacherib. Say that real fast 27 times. Hezekiah and Sennacherib. And... Um, and, and in this story, and in both of these stories that I'm talking to you about, I want you to not just look, as we do often, at the good guy, bad guy, the hero, the villain. Don't just look at the, the, the man of God, um, the, the evil man. But what I want you to do is, is notice the, the way that each one of them talk. Because in each one of these stories that we're going to look at today, you've got one man that's trusting in the flesh and one man that is trusting in, in God. And I want you to notice the way that they talk because the man that trusts in the flesh says things like I, me, mind, over and over and over again. 
And the man who trusts in the Lord has very little um, account of himself, but instead he says things like, the Lord will fight for us. The Lord will work on our behalf. So 2 Chronicles 31, verse 20, the Bible says, Thus Hezekiah did. What did he do? He tore down the Asherah poles. He tore down the worship of other gods. And he established the, the worship of the true living God, um, afresh and anew. And so the Bible says, um, Thus Hezekiah did throughout all of Judah. And he did what was good and right and faithful before the Lord. So Hezekiah is a guy who trusts in the Lord. Even to the point of... Um, being not very popular to some people. He, he trusts in the Lord his God and every work that he undertook to the service of the house of his God in accordance with the law and the commandments, seeking his God, he did with all his heart and he prospered. Why? Because blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, right? And then skip down to Second Chronicles uh, 32, the next chapter down, verse number one, the Bible says, after these things, after he did that, these acts of faithfulness, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came and invaded Judah and encamped himself against the fortified cities, thinking to win them for himself. He just knew it was a sure thing that he had this battle won. Look at verse number five. He set to work, talking about Hezekiah. So Sennacherib is camping against him. He's preparing to do battle. Hezekiah, set his, uh, he set to work resolutely and built up all the wall that was broken down and raised towers up on it. And outside, the, the, outside it, he built another wall, a second wall, and he strengthened um, the Milo in the, the Milo in the city of David, and he also made weapons and shields in abundance. He set combat commanders and the people that gathered them together. Um, he gathered them together in the square at the gate of the city, and he spoke encouragingly to them, saying, "Listen to what he says: Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid or dismayed before the king of Assyria." Now you have to understand that most people would be afraid or dismayed when the king of Assyria says, "I'm coming to take over." He was a savage, it was a savage group of individuals. They, they were taking over all over the place. They were running over, running roughshod over people left and right. And they were pretty much taking whatever uh, they wanted. And so when they come against them, uh, it's, it's noteworthy here that Hezekiah says, Hey, I know that everybody else is scared to death of these guys, but listen to me. Don't you get messed up about this. He begins to encourage them. He says, Don't be afraid or dismayed. He says, for there are more with us than him. And in my mind, I'm thinking, are there really more with us than him? Or can you just consider there always to be more with us than him when God is on our side? Whatever you face today, you can say that. You know what? There's more with me than there are against me. If God be for me, who, can, who, who thinks they can raise their head up against me? That's the word of the Lord. And so the Bible says, um, don't be afraid or dismayed. There are more with us than are with him. Verse number 8. With him is an arm of the flesh. In other words, he's putting all his trust in his armies, in his chariots, in his horses, in his weapons. With him is the arm of the flesh, but with us is the Lord God to help us and to fight our battles. Notice, he, they, did the, they did the work of, of creating the weapons, of, of developing the army, of building the walls. They did all of that work, but that wasn't where their trust was. It's not wrong to have the stuff. It's not wrong to have the bank account. It's not wrong to, to have things in, that, that God gives us as, as uh, uh, blessings in our life. Those things aren't wrong to have, but where it gets wrong is when we lean on them and put our trust in them. With him is the arm of the flesh. With us is the Lord our God. He will fight our battles for us. And the people took confidence from the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. Now look at verse number 9. After this, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, who was besieging at Lachish, uh, with all his forces, sent his servants to Jerusalem, to Hezekiah, king of Judah, and to all the people of Judah. And they were in Jerusalem saying, and so they're going to do a little taunting, a little name calling, a little mud slinging. Verse number 10, thus says Sennacherib, king of Assyria, on what are you trusting that you endure siege in Jerusalem? <clears throat> and listen to me. When you trust in the Lord, the enemy's going to come and say, what do you think you're doing? You, you've got to get a bigger army, man. You better put your trust in some different stuff. You better get a bigger bank account. You, you better really try, look around you. You really think God's going to fight your battle for you? That's the way the enemy does. He says, um, thus says Sennacherib, king of Assyria, on what are you trusting that you endure the siege of Jerusalem? Is not Hezekiah misleading you that he may give you over to die of famine and thirst when he tells you the Lord our God will deliver us from the hand of the king of Assyria? Look at verse 15. 
Now, therefore, don't let Hezekiah deceive you or mislead you in this fashion. And do not believe him. For no God of any nation or kingdom has been able to deliver his people from my hand or from the hand of my fathers. How much less will your God deliver you out of my hand? Verse number 20. Then because of all this, Hezekiah, the king, and Isaiah, the prophet, the son of Amos, prayed because of this and cried out to heaven. You see, when you trust in the Lord, they, they didn't get bigger weapons. They didn't go start building more stuff, more stuff, more stuff. They, they came to a point where they cried out to the Lord. And there might be some people in this house today where it's time for you to cry out to the Lord. Show that you trust in God by crying out to Him concerning your situation. And what was the response of the Lord when they cried out to Him? I'm glad you asked. Verse number 21. And the Lord sent an angel who cut off all the mighty warriors and the commanders of the officers of the camp of the king of Assyria. And we just read that like, and the Lord just cut them off. No, it's a big deal. Big deal. Like, like okay, here, here it is. Like, whatever your problem is today. Like, you cried, you prayed to the Lord, and the Lord comes and changes it just like that. Don't just think you'd be going, oh, and the Lord changed my situation. No, you'd be like, yeah, man, I got to tell somebody. Look what the Lord did. There would be celebration. There'd be some party music playing, right? It would be time to like throw our hands up and worship the Lord and say, God, thank you for all you've done. But we just read through it like, and the Lord cut them off. And so they went on. And then, and then he goes on and he says, so he returned with shame of face. Talking about Sennacherib, you know, the, the one who was so big, bad, and, and, and talking all this stuff and saying, just like all those other gods have tried to do, y'all, gonna, y'all think you're going to do that? You really think your God's going to hear you? Listen to who you're trusting in. You think Hezekiah is going to lead you in that way? There's no way that's going to happen. So the Bible says, and I love this. I I love the fact that he says in verse 21, so he returned with shame of face to his own land. Serves him right. I think think the enemy should go home with shame of face from our lives a little more often because we trust in the Lord, not our stuff. So the enemy, Sennacherib, goes home with shame of face. And when he came down to the house of his God, some of his own struck him down with the sword. Serves him right. Hey, remember, cursed is the man who trusts in man, the arm of the flesh. But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. We see it right here. Verse 22, so the Lord saved Hezekiah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem in the hand of Sennacherib, king of Assyria, from the hand of Sennacherib, king of Assyria, and from the hand of all his enemies, and he provided them for them on every side. Why? That provision comes because he was tapped in like a tree that's planted by the water. And the Lord brings his provision. And the Lord brings exactly what he needed, even when nobody else believed in it. Verse number 23. And many brought gifts to the Lord to Jerusalem and precious things to Hezekiah, king of Judah, so that he was exalted in sight of all nations from that time onward. Isn't that good? And I love that, that we see such an illustration of the fact that when you trust in the things of this life, They'll lead you astray and they'll deliver so short every time. Put your trust in God. Then I want you to see um, another one, and it's David and Goliath. And it's a very well-known story, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time reading through it. You know that, that David wasn't even supposed to be on the battle lines. He wasn't some mighty warrior. David was supposed to be bringing sack lunches to his brothers. Hey, here's some Dr. Pepper and some peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. That's what Daddy told me. to. He sent me down here to bring you some food. But when he got there, delivering some, just doing a menial task of delivering some lunches, when he gets there, he realizes that there's this giant calling out to Israel, and he's not only defiling Israel, but, but he's defiling their God. And he's, he's crying out to them and, and speaking over them. And David says, why is everybody hiding? Who's going to do something about this guy? And long story short, David steps up to him, and he comes on the battlefield, and I'm sure that the giant Goliath was thinking, who, who is this kid? Who is this? And look with me in 1 Samuel 4, chapter 17, verse 45. Then David said to the Philistine, listen to what he said. You come to me, you put your trust in your sword and your spear and your javelin. But I'm telling you, I come to you and the one I put my trust in. The name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. And then David steps out there, you're talking about trust Hey, it's like when the Ar- when Arkansas Razorbacks go to a, a football game, like when they play Florida or when they play LSU in the coming days. I mean, you got to have a lot of trust and faith to start talking smack early, right? <laughs> like, 
This is like going against Alabama and, and just going ahead and getting on out there and saying, y'all just get ready because we're about to take y'all down. We'll see y'all at the end zone, baby, because it's going down today. That's what, this is what David started. This little kid stands in front of a giant. He starts doing things like that. He, he says, this day, I like this faith. This day, the Lord will deliver you in my hand, and I'm going to strike you down, sucker. That, that was my own in, insert there. But. He said, I'm going to cut off your head, and I'll give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Have you ever thought about that? When you put your faith and trust in the Lord and you got those roots down deep in the water and he's providing exactly what you need. Have you ever thought about the, the flourishing life that God pours into you might just be the greatest testimony that the world has ever seen? David is saying today this victory is going to be a testimony and people are going to say there is a God in Israel. That's better than you all act like it is. He says, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not but the things of the flesh, the sword and the spear. For those battles, the Lord's, and he's going to give me into your hand. Give you into my hand. Don't you like that? I love that. I share five distinct characteristics of those who trust in the Lord in those notes, and you can go look at them. But I don't want to rush past today and miss the opportunity to share something special with you. I think you get what I'm saying in, in the idea of the cursing and the blessing that comes from trusting in flesh or man and trusting in the Lord. But I want to share with you a, a letter. It's a little bit of a lengthy letter, but every word of it is so powerful. I want to share with you today, a single mom in our church wrote this to me and just shared what God had done in her. She actually told me first, and I said, can you, can you share that with me? Can you write that down, document it? Because I want to share it with our church. She said, um, remember, it's a single mom. She said, God always provided for me, and he won't stop now. He hasn't brought me this far just to drop me. Like many in my position, single mom, and in my case, college student, I was on food stamps. I had a hard time making ends meet, so I asked for help. My pride was hard to swallow. Shame was a battle as I sat in the room at DHS with my stack of papers. Here I was, thinking not of entitlement or that I was deserving of food stamps, more of I'm willing to admit that I need help and reach out for it. It appeared to me that the Spirit led me to do this, so I used this benefit, or from my view, what I considered God providing. This past spring, I felt a tug on my heart to stop using those food stamps. There wasn't a, a clear, audible voice or something in Scripture that prompted this. Not even a song, not a sermon. No person encouraged me to stop using them. With no vision of how I would be able to supplement the income or explanation or real confirmation, I believe that this was what God was calling me to do. He was asking me to lean completely on Him. The, and she says, this I know is the heartbeat of God. She's saying that the leaning on Him is the heartbeat of God. This I know is the heartbeat of God, that, and it's in line with His Word, and so I decided to stop using the food stamps. I believe that God was working on some character, refining to even ask for the food stamps. But now I see that it was a stepping stone, a part of a process. God had already designed to teach me about himself, one step, one piece at a time. With the leading guidance from the Lord to provide for my financial needs, I chose to exercise my spiritual muscle called trust. It brought back, I brought back memories of moments of victories. I just want to say to some of you here, in moments when we're struggling, sometimes we need to go back and, and build up some Stones of remembrance, some places. That's what they did in the Old Testament. So they would never forget the move and the work of the Lord. And we need to go back to some memories, some places where God did something astounding in our life and remember how he worked on our behalf. It builds faith to do that. That's what she says. She said, I brought back some memories, some moments, some victories of the cross where God provided, proved faithful to me. She said, I stood on this promise from Matthew 6, 24 through 26. No man can serve two masters. Either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, about your body, what you will wear. Is life not more than food and body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? The following months, I look for a job to no avail. 
Partly this is my fault because I was being extremely picky. I wanted to be available to my son, so that gave very limited opportunity to choose from. I could have compromised my parameters, but I just wasn't willing to sacrifice my relationship, time, and presence with my son. And I say, add a girl. I say, add a girl. Y'all agree with me? (laughs) Conveniently, my good friend was having surgery and was going to be out for several weeks. Kind of desperate, I asked, Who's filling in for you? She said, no one. I jumped at the chance to let her know that I would be grateful if she asked her boss if I could temporarily fill in while my friend was out. She said, yes. And I got to go to work for about 10 weeks through the summer. I really thought, okay, this is the job. I just got to work hard and surely they will hire me. But as chance would have it, I didn't get hired and the job ended. I'd be lying if I wasn't disappointed. I'd fallen in love with the people. There were the exact hours... They were what I needed, and it seemed to be such a perfect fit. I remember leaving and saying, thank you, Lord, even though that wasn't a permanent fix. Thank you for the time you gave me. During those months, I, can tell you, I can't tell you that there were random $200 checks coming in the mail, no random cards with cash in them, no obvious gestures of blessing or provision. More time passed, and I'm trusting and believing the Lord. I know he's faithful, but it's getting to the point where I'm going to have to do something different. I was applying for jobs with no interviews, no callback, or a hint of any hope in sight. Sometimes God, he, he, she goes into an, an analogy here that I want you to see. It's so beautiful. She says, sometimes God lets go of my hands and shows me my heart. Much like a toddler learning to take its first steps. They're leaning this way and unable to balance on their own. Mama holds on with both hands and keeps them upright as they learn the mechanics of walking and building up their strength in their legs. Mama steadies the sway and the toddler stays on the direct path. But there comes a time when mama has to let go and the baby, goes, the baby is going to figure out quickly whether they can stand, learning where to gain confidence and moving forward. It's not that mama ever left. Believe me, she's hovering over that gentle baby, that sweet baby, carefully focused on every single step the baby makes. She hovers close, waiting to extend a hand when the baby needs help, grieving over the falls and celebrating each time they dust off, stand up and try again. It's not that God left me. He just let go of my hands and say, you say you trust me, but do you really? He was showing me my heart. Finally, I got, the job, I got a job interview at a bank. I needed this like yesterday. I called my friend and asked if the boss I worked for over the summer would write a letter of recommendation. She said she'd be happy to and I could get it after the weekend. When I went in to pick it up, she said, can you stay a minute? I said, sure. My boss sat down with me and said, you did a great job this summer. I didn't really have a way to justify hiring you at the time, which is why I haven't yet. But you asked for a letter of recommendation, and I knew you were looking for another position and was afraid you might go somewhere else. So I made a position for you. It's completely flexible. Any hours you need. If your son is sick, just take the day off. If you're up late studying, studying, come in late. Basically, you'll be my personal assistant in whatever I or the office needs that will be your job. You'll never be bored or, and you will learn a variety of things. And she asked me what kind of pay I was willing, what kind of pay I needed and was willing to meet my need. I went to the bank interview, but I wasn't going to take that job. I knew exactly where God wanted me. Can I just say that never in my life has an employer said, I value you so much, I will make room for you as not to lose the treasure you are. Never have I been treated as a person instead of a number. It's as if God said, You are the apple of my eye, precious and treasured and honored in my sight, and I love you. Trust in me, and I will provide abundantly more than you can ask for. I didn't win a bunch of money, and I wasn't handed an envelope of cash. No, he provided a job. God had a a plan, a fix that wouldn't just get me through next week, but actually would provide for my need. He supplied the means for me not only to provide for myself, but to provide for the kingdom. God knew the bigger picture. When the months felt fruitless and like God had forgot, his hands were steadily forming the pieces. But I had to do my part. I had to humble myself and ask for food stamps and walk out my trust in God and his faithfulness to his promises and in his word. And as a result, he blessed me beyond measure. Come on, is that not a powerful story? And the Bible says that God is not a respecter of persons. What he does for one, he will do for you, friend. 
He will do it for you. Put your trust in him because cursed is the man who trusts in himself. Who are we to think that we could trust in ourselves anyway? Trust in ourselves or in man or in an arm of the flesh, but blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. Would you stand with me all across the room today? I don't know how it's going to work out for you. I don't know how God's plan or provision looks like. And I'm not saying that just because you trust in Him that everything is perfect, just like that story I just read you. What I know is that God is trustworthy and He is faithful. And you can trust Him if you're willing to today. Would you pray with me? Father, all across this room right now, I pray that you would move, that you would stir hearts, that you would draw people to you. In this moment, Lord, let this moment be a moment of response to you. I just pray right now with heads bowed and eyes closed, God, that you would deal with our hearts and that you would draw us to a place of trust. Lord, that you would help us to to put away all the stuff that we found security in. Thank you for those blessings, God, but we we were never intended to lean on them. Today, God, we trust in you. We hope in you. We believe in you. We have faith in you. With every head bowed and every eye closed as a way of response right now, can you just respond across this room? Those of you who are saying, Pastor Mark, I want to trust in God with a, in a greater measure. I, I, today, I, I want to, to have a greater trust than I've ever had in, in, in the Lord. And so with a hand up raised right now, you're saying, that's me, Pastor Mark. Just raising up your hand. Hands going up all across the room. We want to trust you, Lord. We want to trust you, oh God. Father, would you do it in this place? Hands that are going up are a response, Lord, of a a work that you are doing. And so I pray right now, Lord, that your Holy Spirit has already done that work of of, of convicting and dealing with us. So, Father, I pray that you would do the work of of finishing that and sealing that, that work, God, that change. Right now, Father, I pray that you'd help us to to turn aside from the stuff that we've put our trust in, our faith in, and that we would look to you for everything we have need of. We declare in this house, Lord, that you are our source. You are our, our, our sufficiency. You are the one whom all provision comes from. You are the stream of living water that pours into us when the heat of life comes, when the drought of life comes. Father, we don't become anxious because our dependency isn't on the government or the things of this life or the the, the 401k or the bank account. Our sufficiency and our strength comes from you, oh God. And we receive from you today. We thank you, God, for doing it in us. And now, Lord, we just bless you and say that you are a good God. You are trustworthy. You are faithful when we aren't. Lord, you are mighty and powerful to do anything that concerns us. Just like the story I shared, if if it's not already in existence, God, I believe that you can create a a job position or a, a, a provision for us. I thank you for doing it. I bless your name today for what you're doing in our church. And we thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Amen. Come on, can we give the Lord praise today for what he's doing in our lives? I believe he's working in you. And I'm excited about that today. Excited about that. Let that word go with you all this week and let the Lord stir it in your heart.